amid the opulence of Belle Epoque, France, a trial took place that threatened to unravel the very meaning of human legal justice. Michel Herrour and Gabrielle Bompard, two French citizens living their lives quietly in Paris, were launched into the spotlight following the discovery of a decomposing corpse, the reconstruction of a destroyed wooden trunk, and an international manhunt. Whilst their names eventually disappeared into obscurity, the crime they were involved in left an indelible mark on legal history, as the first case using hypnosis as a defence for murder, offering the jury the unique opportunity to not only decide the fate of the convicted, but to reshape the legal definition of free will in a courtroom forever. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Dark Histories, Season 7, Episode 18. I'm Ben, your host as always, and it's good to be back on the mic as summer is drawing to a close here in England and we're sort of getting a little renaissance, but it's, uh, but yeah, the nights are definitely starting to draw in and are already seeing advertisements for Halloween things, which is very exciting. Pretty much autumn is my most favourite time of the year, and spooky season will very soon be upon us, which is very exciting stuff. Before we start this episode, just a quick shout-out. Just a quick shout-out to today's sponsors, which are BetterHelp. Dark History does have a discount code if you're thinking of signing up. Betterhelp.com forward slash Dark Histories. It's all in the show notes. But anyway, enough of that. Uh, let's jump into this week's episode, which I picked this episode this week because I thought it would be an interesting juxtaposition uh, along with last week's episode. So we're going back to France, but this time we're going back about 400 years later than last episode. And we're going to take a look at another murder altogether. This week's episode is called Hypnotism and Murder. The Bloody Trunk of Ero and Bompard. Paris in the 1880s was a relatively peaceful period. With the end of the Franco-Prussian War and the Paris Commune slowly fading into the past, France, and Paris in particular, began growing its economy before its great leap forward in the 1890s. In the ten years since the end of the war, the population of Paris had grown 14%, leading the city to become both the richest and poorest in France, as a huge influx of people from across the economic spectrum were attracted to the city from across France and wider Europe, creating one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. Old aristocracy, melded with the new money, brought to the city by bankers, financiers and entrepreneurs, whilst the working classes, the homeless and the poor flocked together, making up 73% of the population in the few small enclaves of crowded housing in the centre of the city or else were pushed to the outer edges as housing was routinely demolished to make room for the sparkling boulevards that would go on to symbolise the picturesque nightlife of La Belle Epoque and cement the café culture that would facilitate the free movement of intellectual discourse so crucial to the city's culture. As the city flourished, so too did the vibrancy of the culture. Artists like Monet, Degas and Renoir challenged traditional conventions by painting light and atmosphere above form whilst literary salons were home to names like Zola, Proust and Montpassant. In Montmartre, the Moulin Rouge, established in 1889, became the public centre of Parisian bohemian life, home to the most extravagant performances in all of Europe, from donkey rides and clowns to its infamous cabaret. The bourgeois mingled with the artists, writers and degenerates with a hedonistic abandon only possible for a transient fragment of time as those fighting the decadence of the rich walked intoxicated towards the bright lights, swallowed by the same. In 1889, the city hosted a World's Fair in order to showcase Paris's reputation as an academic, scientific and engineering powerhouse, unveiling the Eiffel Tower, the tallest structure in the world at the time, as the Expo's centrepiece. Despite several countries boycotting the Expo due to its theme as a celebration of the overthrowing of the monarchy a hundred years prior, it attracted more than 32 million visitors and reeled in over 8 million francs in profit. Visitors included Thomas Edison promoting the phonograph and Buffalo Bill with his Wild West show, whilst other technologies like the elevator, the telephone and a host of electric gadgets and gizmos piled up inside the gallery of machines drew names like Nikola Tesla, Henry James and a host of princes, princesses, journalists and politicians from around the globe. 
Although the city was awash with optimism on the surface, however, it wasn't without its challenges. Anarchists and socialists were both in control of burgeoning movements, and the influx of a diverse population heralded the way for a buoyant crime rate. Social tensions bubbled away just below the surface, constantly threatening to boil over. As labour strikes highlighted class divisions and radical politics gained a foothold, whilst the French government floundered in its efforts to gain stability, leading to a general feeling of disillusionment. Street crime was common, as pickpockets made out throughout the expo and prostitution, legal and regulated brothels, spilled out into the streets, with the women frequently becoming characters in the flourishing penny newspaper press, as crimes of passion became celebrated gossip throughout the cafes. As the summer of 1889 warmed up, three Parisians walked through the streets entirely anonymous amongst the vast crowds. Toussaint Augustin Gouffet, Michel Hérault and Gabriel Bompard, all three completely unaware that they would soon become the central characters in one of the decade's greatest and most celebrated crimes of passion. Only two of them would live to see it unfold in its entirety. 42-year-old Toussaint Augustin Gouffet was one of the successful New Money Parisians. Though he walked with a limp, which often suggested a turbulent past, his outer appearance was in all other respects as refined as his taste for the café culture in the southern streets of Montmartre. Well-groomed, his oiled moustache and manicured fingernails set off his gold jewellery that reflected the lamplights of the Parisian terraces as he socialised, sipping absinthe and dining late into the evenings. Working as a bailiff, his work was not always glamorous, but it had afforded him the luxury of a bustling social and romantic life, along with the ability to raise his three daughters in a comfortable environment, despite their mother leaving him widowed eight years prior. The night of Friday the 26th of July, 1889, was presenting another tantalising prospect for Gouffet, and as he sat, around 7pm, eating pasta with carrots and green beans on the terrace of the Café Veyron in Montmartre following a long week's work, he checked the time impatiently, waiting for his friends to settle their bills and head off to the International Expo, leaving him to fulfil his own much more exciting appointment. That afternoon, he had bumped into an acquaintance, Michel Ayrault, on the street whilst returning to work from lunch. He had had lunch with Ayrault and his young mistress, Gabrielle Bompard, the day before, and took a keen interest in the grey-eyed, petite young lady, especially when she had confided with him that she was beginning to tire of Erod's company. Errol had not missed his dining companion's interest in his mistress, and so, when he bumped into Gouffet that afternoon, he was quick to let him know that she was yesterday's news, following a spontaneous break-up. Intrigued, Gouffet listened intently, as Errol told him that he believed that Gabrielle had found him attractive and that he should pursue her himself. In what seemed a sheer coincidence, moments after saying goodbye, Gouffet next bumped into Gabrielle herself, who told him the same news that he'd just heard and offered up her address, suggesting that he head over to her apartment at 8pm that night. Now, as the appointed hour approached, Gouffet finished up his meal, bade farewell to his friends and headed over with an enthusiastic lightness to his step to the tall four-storey white stone terraced apartments of the Rue Tronçon de Corderoy, where Gabrielle lived. Knocking on the door at 8.15, Gabrielle, dressed only in a sheer dressing gown, tied with a sash around her middle, pulled open the door and invited him inside, closing and locking it behind him. The following day, Gouffet's housekeeper, Mathilde Pagnon, woke up surprised to find that the master of the house had not yet returned from the night before. In an effort to preserve his modesty, she stepped into his bedroom, ruffled the bedclothes, filled the wash basin and told his daughters that their father had left early that morning on urgent business. Truthfully, however, she was concerned. Although she was used to Gouffet returning at all hours of the morning after spending the majority of the night with one of his many mistresses, he made it an absolute priority to at least sleep in his own bed in order to take breakfast with his daughters. When he still hadn't returned by lunchtime, she visited Gouffet's brother-in-law, Louis-Marie Landry, to see if he had any idea of Gouffet's whereabouts. Though he hadn't seen him, Landry thought that perhaps he had gone directly to his office after his night out, as he frequently worked at odd hours, either late into the night or early in the mornings. Upon visiting his office, though, Landry found nothing but a dishevelled desk with over 14,000 francs left out in the open, 
a move that he found particularly strange. The money was not in itself unusual. Gouffé frequently collected debts, so large amounts of cash in the office was fairly normal. But in normal circumstances, all the money would have been kept locked in the office safe overnight. Inquiring the building's concierge, he discovered that a man had visited the office the night before, just after 9pm, but the concierge was unable to provide much of a description outside of the fact that he was wearing an overcoat and a hat. As it happened, Claude Jolie wasn't the concierge at all. That was his wife's job. Normally a bread delivery man, he had been standing in for his wife the night before, so he wasn't especially aware of Gouffet, though he did say that he knew he worked late at night at times, and as the man who had visited the office had had a key, he had assumed that that was who it was and paid him no mind. Now, feeling more concerned, Landry went to visit Remy Francois Lornay, Gouffet's business associate, who took care of the more unsavoury matters in Gouffet's line of work, collecting debts and roughing up debtors who were behind on payments. Lornay had not seen nor heard from Gouffet at all, a fact he relayed to Landry with some dramatics, putting on enough of a show that Landry found the whole performance quite suspicious. By nightfall, with no news, Landry finally decided it was time to report his concerns to the police. Heading to the local station along with Lornay, the two men gave a detailed description of Gouffet and both gave their statements to the commissioner on duty. There was no reason to believe that Gouffet would have committed suicide, they explained. Both men convinced that he had been a happy man with a happy family, though they had to concede the truth that, in his line of work, Gouffet was susceptible to making a fair few enemies. The commissioner carried out a few cursory interviews with the concierge of Gouffet's office and her husband before he decided to turn the case over to the Paris detectives and the Surete chief, Marie-Francois Goron. Chief Goron had lived a fairly colourful career after fighting in the French armed forces during campaigns in both Martinique and Algeria before becoming involved in the Franco-Prussian War. He had left France for a peaceful life in Argentina, though within two years he found himself back in Paris and in 1881 he joined the police force and rose to the head position by 1886. An asthmatic with a penchant for smoking and greasing his rather tremendous moustache, he was keenly impressed by the emerging world of forensics and of detective literature, which he would later go on to author himself after his retirement at the end of the century. Initially, Goran wasn't particularly interested in Gouffet's missing person case. People disappeared all the time, and they usually wound up found, relaxing somewhere out of the city with their mistress. He didn't dismiss the case entirely. The investigating magistrate, Paul Dopfer, was placed on the case to look into the details whilst the chief inspector, Pierre Jean, was overseeing. The trouble was, there was next to no clues and a host of possibility. With Gouffet being a widow, trouble with a woman became the most likely line of inquiry, especially as Gouffet was known to have been something of a ladies' man. Throughout the rest of July, the police spent their time questioning over 20 women who were known to have slept with the smooth-talking bailiff just in that month. None of them knew anything at all about his disappearance, however, and after an exhausting round of questioning, everyone found themselves precisely where they had started. The only other suspicion they had was Gouffet's shady business associate, Remy Francois Lornay, though in truth it was only really prejudices surrounding his line of work that drew that conclusion for them, and after they finished a lengthy round of questioning with him, the officials were forced to concede that he knew nothing about the disappearance. For a short time, Gouffet's brother-in-law, Louis-Marie Landry, fell under suspicion himself when it became known that he had crept into Gouffet's office and removed a stack of paperwork in the days leading up to his disappearance. But when he was questioned on his actions, it turned out that he had been destroying a collection of letters sent to Gouffet from scorned lovers, hoping to avoid any embarrassment or loss of reputation for Gouffet and his family. Part of the difficulty of the case was that, given the nature of Gouffet's work, they had all at once no solid leads and hundreds of potential leads. The bailiff had made a considerable sum of money, and much of it through treading over those who were struggling financially. He could well have made hundreds, if not thousands, of enemies over the years, and along the way he had amassed a fortune worth over 300,000 francs. Essentially, he was a multimillionaire by today's standards. He was, in many respects, a perfect target for a huge collection of people, but none with any names or any real suspicion on their backs. As the days ticked by, bodies did turn up, making their way to the public gallery in the Paris morgue, 
to be identified by the steady stream of, of public onlookers who cruised through the macabre presentations daily, but all turned out to be identified and none were goofy. By the middle of August, the press were ganging up on the police, blasting them for being incompetent and getting nowhere in the missing persons case. But the truth was, the police simply had nowhere to look. Then, with the turn of the wind, things started looking up for Goron and the investigation. 300 miles southeast of Paris, in a small village named Millery, on the southern outskirts of Lyon, the locals began making a fuss due to a rancid smell that was enveloping the village constantly for the past week. Denis Kofi, a local road mender, was given the unappealing task of getting to the bottom of the foul stench and set about scouring the roadsides up and down the river for an animal carcass or similar that could have been the cause. Making his way along the dusty embankment, he noticed one particular area where the smell seemed to concentrate. Peering over the bank into a deep ditch, he noticed what looked like an old sack tossed into the bushes below, so scooting down, he began to investigate. Once surrounded by the dense acacia bushes, he reached the sack and tentatively peeled back an opening, revealing what looked unmistakably like a human head, even despite the obvious decay. Realising the situation, he climbed back up the bank and headed back into town to fetch the police, and by evening, he was back out on the road with Officer Jacques Monge. Together, they climbed back down to the grim body and took a better look. It was definitely human, although the eyes and nose had decomposed and the features were bloated. The beard and moustache clued them in that it was that of a man. Working together, they dragged the sack up to the roadside, covered it in grass and headed back into town to report the find to the magistrate and doctor. By evening, the town was alive with gossip as the body, loaded onto a cart, was carried by lamplight back through the town and into the moor. Unfortunately, the more qualified doctor, the University of Lyon's own professor of pathology, was away on holiday, so it fell to his student, Dr. Bernard, to get to the bottom of the mystery body lying on the mortuary table the following morning. Performing an autopsy would have been no small task for anyone, and Bernard found it tough going. Several of the internal organs had already decomposed, and the victim's brain was described as semi-liquid. Despite the poor state of the remains, however, Bernard still managed to conclude that the body had been that of a man aged between 35 and 45 years old, standing 5 foot 7 inches tall and weighing about 165 pounds with dark black hair. Dead for between 3 to 5 weeks, it appeared he had been strangled due to a pair of fractures in the larynx. Whoever the man was, he had clearly been a man of means as he had finely manicured nails. Outside of those few clues, however, the body gave up nothing else and the police were left staring at an unidentified corpse and no claims of any missing person to tie it to. The next day, August 15th, a local farmer named Alphonse Ricard was out collecting escargot on the banks of the river when he came across a collection of wooden scraps that seemed to be the remains of an old trunk. Thinking he might use them as firewood, he began rounding them up before realising that they clung to a particularly revolting stench. Choosing not to burn them, he instead handed them into the police, aware that a body had been found outside Millery the night before. It was a fortunate decision for the police, as the very next day, an officer out by the bank where the body was found turned up a key in the mud that fitted the lock of the smashed up trunk. Wanting to be sure that the trunk and the body were linked, the police ordered the shards of the wood to be reassembled so that they could gauge its size, and once brought back to its original shape, it was clear that the body curled as it was into a fetal position, would have fitted neatly into the trunk's interior, allowing them to conclude that they could be certain that the body had been carried about within the trunk before being tossed out into the ditch, the trunk then being carried a little further along the road, where it was demolished and discarded by the riverbank. Unfortunately, that was all they had, and as far as the story went for them, there was no ID for the body, and no killer on the horizon. Back in Paris, Goron was poring over the provincial newspapers when he came upon the story of the mystery body found outside Lyon. With his own investigation thoroughly ground to a halt, he took the powers that be into contacting Lyon police and inquiring further about the body. The situation was complicated, however, and had several problems. Chiefly was the fact that the provincial police were notoriously unappreciative of the Paris police meddling in their affairs, but compounding this issue was that the description of the mystery body did not really fit well with the description of Gouffet at all. His hair was noted as light brown, not the dark black of the corpse. 
Still, keen on what was little more than a hunch, Goron contacted a local Leon journalist instead to find out everything he could about the Millery trunk case. The journalist gave Goron the lowdown on the case so far and included a useful little tidbit of information that had been kept out of the papers. The wooden shards of the trunk had included a torn baggage label indicating that it had travelled from Paris to Lyon via an express train on the 27th of July, the day after Gouffet had gone missing. Unfortunately, the year of the label had been torn away which allowed the Lyon police to claim that they believed it to have been in 1888 rather than 1889 and therefore it was impossible to have any link with the Gouffet case. Gouron was still not happy, however, and so he set about convincing the Paris and Lyon investigating judges to allow him to send a member of Gouffet's family to Lyon to see if they could identify the body. After some pains, he succeeded in gaining access to the body and he sent Gouffet's brother-in-law south, escorted by Brigadier Lyon Soudé, in hopes that he might recognise the body as Gouffet. When the pair arrived in Lyon, they spent the majority of the day jumping through bureaucratic hoops put in place by the Lyon officials, until finally, by dim lamplight, they were allowed to enter the morgue and take a look at the rotting corpse laid out on the stone floor. It was an unnerving sight for anyone, a fact that Gouffet's brother-in-law confirmed when he told Gouron that, being in a sinister place like that, your single preoccupation is to get out of there as quickly as possible. Seeing the body's dark hair, he quickly confirmed that it was not Gouffet and hightailed it back out into the fresh air of the street above, and then hopped back on a train to Paris to return the bad news to Goron. Just over a week later, on the 24th of August, the body was finally identified as a local Lyon architect, Monsieur Pellion, who had been missing for some time. It was an identification that put the final nail into the coffin for Goron's only potential lead on the Gouffet case. By now, the investigation had been going on for a month and had turned up nothing. It had just wasted a considerable amount of time. Putting the Lyon body behind him, Goron instead turned to Lornay, the suspicious business associate. In recent days, he had learnt that Gouffet and Lornay had been overheard in a cafe having an argument, with Gouffet demanding a huge sum of money from Lornay. Even worse, for the shady businessman, another witness had testified that he had overheard Lornay threaten to kill Gouffet. In the drought of the Gouffet case, it was an exciting lead. However, it was soon running into a particularly dead end, when Lornay's alibi was confirmed by a dozen witnesses who had seen him at all hours throughout the night that Gouffet had gone missing. It hadn't been entirely futile, however, as during the questioning, Lornay had mentioned another name, possibly in the hopes of getting the police off his own back. Michel Hérault, a mutual acquaintance of both Gouffet and Lornay, had also been missing since the night of Gouffet's disappearance, along with his mistress, Gabrielle Bompard. The police were initially unenthusiastic about the new names entering the scene, especially after visiting Hérault's wife, who told them that her husband had run off with mistresses in the past. This time, he had told her that he had gone to Rio de Janeiro on business, though she suspected it was probably another mistress. Gouffet's family put up a reward for information of 10,000 francs, just as everything seemed to fall apart for Goron once more. Desperate, Goron released photos of Michel Hérault and Gabrielle Bompard across France and internationally, in the hopes that this tenuous link might somehow lead somewhere. At the same time, he struggled to shake his hunch that the body in Lyon was not quite finished with. Heading to the train station in Paris, he inquired after the records of luggage sent aboard the Paris to Lyon Express on the 27th of July for both years 1888 and 1889. No matches could be found for 1888, but just as Goron had expected all along, there was a record matching the trunk for 1889. Now convinced that the trunk had concealed Gouffet's body, Goron redoubled his efforts with Leon, applying for an exhumation of the body and a second autopsy to be carried out. After a short delay, his request was granted, and by early November, he was stepping on board a train headed for Leon himself, where he hoped to get to the bottom of the mystery corpse once and for all. Far from Rio de Janeiro, Michel Hérault stepped off a steamer in Montreal, Canada, closely tailed by his young mistress, disguised as his teenage daughter, Gabrielle Bompard. Aged 46, Hérault had lived a relatively transient life on both sides of the Atlantic. Having been born near Saint-Étienne in 1843, his father, who had worked as a successful silk dealer, moved the family to Barcelona, where Hérault had received a solid education before the family moved back to France in order to operate a vineyard. At the age of 16, 
He had spent two years in prison, though the records that would explain why no longer exist. Once he had been released, he enrolled in the French military and served in Mexico. Winding up falling in love with a local, he escaped the military by stealing a horse and running away, leading him into a roaming life, staying within South America, learning Spanish, Portuguese and English, until an amnesty was passed, allowing him to return to Paris. Back in his home country, Ero struggled to settle, however, and he spent several years jumping back and forth between South America and France, where he worked quite frequently as a con man, passing himself off as a business emissary to Napoleon III, before he finally returned to France in order to help out on the family-run vineyard. Once at home, he discovered that the vineyard was not in good financial shape, and so along with his brother, he visited their mother, hoping to gain a loan to prop the business up. His mother declined the loan, but Ero was not willing to accept it, so he threatened his mother that he would tear up a cherished photograph of her dead husband, Ero's own father, if she would not cough up any money. After she finally capitulated, Ero took off with the money, leaving the vineyard to slide into bankruptcy in his wake. In his 40s, he took to wearing a toupee and working in Paris as a director at the Fribourg and Sea Trading Company, which is where he first met Gabrielle Bompard when she came in for a job in the late summer of 1888. Gabrielle had also had a transient upbringing, though it was somewhat less transatlantic than her rose. Born in Lille to a wealthy family, she was sent to a convent school at five years old, but shortly after, her mother died and her father decided to send her away to live with her uncle in Belgium, where she stayed for eight years, living a relatively happy life. Upon returning to France, she was greeted with the unattractive position of living with a father that she barely knew and his new mistress, the ex-governess of their house. Luckily, it wasn't a position that she had to endure for too long, as her father arranged to get her out of his feet almost immediately, sending her off to another convent school. Struggling to settle down, Gabrielle quickly gained the reputation as a problem child, finally being sent home after she accused the vicar of sexually molesting her. Her father immediately arranged a new position for her in Lille, but she didn't manage a single semester there before being kicked out once more. It was a record that she maintained at her next school also. Eventually, she was sent to a convent school specially for wayward girls, which functioned much more like a prison than any centre for education. Whilst there, she was thought to have been a submissive, docile girl with high intelligence and obediency, but a tendency towards peculiar friendships. In 1886, aged 18, she was sent home, though things continued to be difficult. At a loss at how to control his daughter, Gabrielle's father opted to enlist the family doctor to attempt to hypnotise her in order to alter her behaviour, but it proved fruitless. Eventually, as he geared up to send her away to another convent for wayward girls, Gabrielle took it upon herself to run away to Paris in August of 1888. It seemed like a good plan at first, until she found herself broke after a single week, which was how she ended up in the office of Michel Ero, applying for a job at his company. Although Ero was married and had his own daughter and was more than twice Gabrielle's age, that didn't stop him from charming her, paying her rent, taking her out to restaurants, shopping for clothes and hooking her as his mistress. The good times hadn't lasted too long, however, and shortly after Ero was sacked for stealing money, he began abusing Gabrielle physically and mentally. At one point, she had tried to run away but he had dragged her back into her apartment by the throat, practically strangling her on the way. And that was how the relationship continued for several months, a cycle of abuse and struggle, until, eventually, a plan was formed between the pair to kill Toussaint Augustin Gouffet, steal his money and run away to South America. The first half of the plan had been successfully carried out. They had travelled south from Paris with Gouffet's body stuffed inside a trunk that they had bought whilst in London together, and they had dumped them both over an embankment outside of Lyon. After staying south for a few weeks, they then travelled to London, and then on to Liverpool, where they changed their names and sailed across the Atlantic, with Gabrielle disguised as Ero's teenage son, before working their way through Canada, and then south into California. Now, following a second name change and a new disguise as father and daughter, they eventually wound up in California, with Ero posing as a businessman hoping to set up a cognac distillery for export to France in order to ensnare would-be investors. In Canada, they had met a wealthy businessman named Georges Garanger, who had been very interested in both Gabrielle and Aero's distillery business. Promising to meet them in California, 
the couple were waiting patiently on his arrival. Ero saw Garanger as a potential investor to scam, but Gabrielle saw him as much more. Having grown tired of the constant abuse from Ero, Garanger represented an escape to Gabrielle, and so she sat waiting impatiently for his arrival, plying her own seduction. When Garanger did arrive in California a few days after he had promised, it was to a thoroughly warm welcome. It didn't take long for Gabrielle to seduce Garanger. In truth, she had already done much of the work in Canada, and the would-be investor had already been smitten by her youth and charm. Whilst the trio wined and dined their way through the Napa Valley on Garanger's money, Hero began trickling finances away from him. $200 here, $300 there, all for business loans that he assured him he could claim back as soon as they were back in France. All the while, Gabrielle took him shopping and got him to buy her luxury coats. Aero could tell a hook's fish when he saw one, and so he struck a deal with Garanger. He would put in two-thirds of the $300,000 needed to get the distillery up and running, with Garanger chipping in the final third. Both parties taking a share of the profits equal to their investment. Of course, Aero's money was entirely fictional. Garanger signed the contract, and quickly Hero began working on extracting the $100,000 from his bank accounts. Recognising Garanger's affection towards Gabrielle, and thoroughly unaware of Gabrielle's true intentions, Hero told his new business partner that Gabrielle's aunt had been taken ill back in France, and so he requested that Garanger would escort her home whilst he finished up the distillery business in California. Keen to spend more time with Gabrielle, Garanger accepted at once, and the pair took off back to Canada where they began the long journey to France. Aero had no intention of them ever arriving, however. He had set up a plan in which he would request Garanger send him his share of the money whilst they were stopping over in Canada, and then he arranged to meet up with Gabrielle in New York, where they would kill Garanger and make off for South America. Gabrielle had other plans, though. As soon as they hit the road towards Canada, she told Garanger everything. That Aero was a con man only after his money, who was planning to kill him in New York. And so instead, the couple diverted themselves through Nova Scotia and on towards Liverpool, where they would continue on to Paris. As part of her coming clean to Garanger, Gabrielle told him her real name, which, incredibly, he had not recognised. It was a feat that was quite impressive, as the names of both Gabrielle Bompard and Michel Ero had been all over the papers for some time, following an arrest warrant being placed on their heads in late December. As Gabrielle and Garanger headed for Paris, Aero fumed alone in New York, realising all too late just what had happened. The con man had been conned. It was now the oblivious Garanger who was due a surprise, however, as the pair stepped off the train in Paris and Gabrielle found herself a minor celebrity. Whilst Gabrielle and Aero had been gallivanting across North America, Goron had been back in Lyon, working hard and coming up against bureaucratic hurdles that had eclipsed every bit of corruption and incompetence that the Lyon police had thrown in his past so far. Despite granting them the right to exhume the remains of the Millery trunk body, it was soon discovered that no one actually knew where the body was, after it had been unceremoniously dumped into a mass grave with no markings on the unremarkable coffin whatsoever. Furious, Goron despaired at the lack of professionalism on display. Dr. Bernard was able to call the chief's fury partially after he mentioned that he had a sample of the body's hair that he had taken during the autopsy. Thrilled, the two got to work immediately and Goron, upon inspecting the hair, ordered for a bowl of distilled water. Placing the strands of hair in the water, he worked the grime away from the hair until pulling them out and drying them, they had lightened several shades to an entirely new, light brown colour. More convinced than ever, Goron sent a telegram to Paris requesting a hairbrush be sent from Gouffet's belongings, and before long he was matching the cleaned up strands alongside those taken from Gouffet's hairbrush. The small samples matched precisely in colour and texture. It was simultaneously exciting and disappointing for Goron, who was now sure that the body was Gouffet. Unfortunately, the body itself had been vanished away, just as it was almost within his grasp. At least, It had been vanished away until he caught up with an assistant to Dr. Bernard who had worked with the doctor to carry out the autopsy. This assistant had exciting news for the Paris police chief. Before the body had been dumped, he had thrown a hat into the coffin, which he had also marked, on a hunch that someday they may need to exhume their remains. 
It was a remarkable stroke of luck for Goron, like nothing he experienced on the case so far, and an act of genius on behalf of the assistant. Excitedly, they set about uncovering the correct body and having it brought in for a second autopsy the very next day. This time, Dr. Alexandre Lassasson from the University of Lyon was available to carry out the autopsy himself, and he set about the difficult task immediately. If the body had been in a poor state before, it was utterly wretched by now. It took him three full days to piece together enough evidence, concluding that the body had been an inch taller than initially thought. The hair colour was also different now. Fully washed and cleansed of decomposing grime, the victim had a full head of light brown hair. La Sasson also discovered the victim had suffered a problem with his leg that had stunted its development, likely resulting in the owner walking with a limp, a fact that neatly matched Gouffet. He also uncovered a missing molar that had been removed some years prior to the death, and Goron was able to contact Gouffet's dentist, confirming that he had removed that exact tooth several years before. If that was not enough to conclusively tie the body to Gouffet, it was finally stamped home when the hair from the body was examined under a microscope alongside the hair taken from Gouffet's hairbrush. The two strands matched perfectly. Goron had finally found his missing man, as well as a certain degree of retribution. He had been hounded by the press for following a hunch so relentlessly, and now he had been proved right to have done so. Triumphantly, he returned to Paris, along with the remains of both Gouffet and the smashed-up trunk. Now it was his job to try and find the owners of the said trunk. Calling in specialist craftsmen, he had the furniture fully restored and placed in the Paris morgue, where he hoped one of the several thousand visitors per day would be able to recognise it. In fact, he had underestimated what a pull the trunk would have. By now, the case had become the hottest topic in the French press, and within the first weekend, an estimated 25,000 visitors filed past the bloody trunk of Millery, hoping to catch the coattails of all the excitement. By Tuesday, this number had doubled again as lions formed outside the morgue at 8am every morning. Despite the huge amount of interest, however, results were not as quick to come by as Goron had hoped. Until one day, in late November, when a cabinet maker wrote to the police to inform them that he was absolutely sure it had been made in London. The telltale signs to him were in the size and the nails used. The trunk had been made to measure by the English yard, he said, and not the French measurements. And, even more telling, the nails were of a type only manufactured in England. This dovetailed with a second key lead that fluttered into Goron's postbox that week, after a French landlord in London had written to him, sure that he had housed the couple named Michel Hérault and Gabriel Bompard that the police had been looking for. What's more, the couple had been carrying a trunk that he knew they had bought at a shop named Svanziger's on Edgware Road. By mid-December, an excited Goron was headed across the channel to London himself with the restored trunk in tow. Whilst there, he was able to get positive IDs on both the trunk and the French couple, as well as a host of witness accounts. One of the more unusual accounts came from a patron of a bar who had seen the couple argue after Ero had attempted to hypnotise Gabrielle for entertainment, leading to Gabrielle slapping her partner across the face. Both parties had returned to France shortly before the disappearance of Gouffet, with Gabrielle returning first and Ero making his way back to Paris just five days before Gouffet's disappearance. With all fingers pointed firmly towards the mysterious French couple, Goron put out an arrest warrant for them both, returning to Paris, sure that he was on the right track. Finally, he felt the investigation was reaching the final leg. The only problem he had now was that no one had seen nor heard of either Gabrielle or Ero since the murder of Gouffet, and the world was a big place. Fortunately, both were, more or less, on their way to Goron by themselves. On January the 16th, Goron received a large envelope with a postmark from New York. Looking at the front of the heavy package, he realised he had been lucky to to have even received it at all, as not only was his name misspelt, but the postage had been woefully underfunded. Opening it up, he saw that inside was a 20-page rambling letter that he soon realised was from Michel Hérault. Looking to clear his name, Hérault was swearing that he had nothing to do with the murder of Gouffet. I was neither accomplice nor murderer, and know nothing of the affair except what I read in papers, he wrote. He continued on confidently that it was mere coincidence that he and Gabrielle had left France the day after Gouffet's disappearance. 
He wrote that they had only left Paris due to troubles at his work where he had been accused of stealing money. He admitted to having purchased the trunk whilst they were on a trip to London, but said that the last he had seen of it was when Gabrielle had left London for Paris, and the next time that he had seen her was back in London when they set off for Canada, and when she had returned, she had been without the trunk, and which she had told him she had sold in Paris. The letter then started a long and bitter rant about Gabrielle running off with another man named Caronja. Now, Hero was sure that they were headed back to Paris, but, looking to throw his old lover under the bus, he wrote that he was also sure that Gabrielle was Gouffet's murderer. Once Gabrielle was under arrest, he said that he would happily return to Paris and assist the police with the conviction as soon as possible. It was a curious rambling mess of a letter, but in its bitter jealousy, it included many clues as to Aero's whereabouts. As for the accusation, Goron was less sure. Over the next week, he received two more equally eccentric letters from Aero, one postmarked in Montreal and the other in Philadelphia. If Gabrielle really was headed back to France, however, Goron figured it best to work with the press to paste her picture all over the front pages and make it impossible for her to travel without being recognised. Two days later, Gabrielle and Garanger arrived back in Paris, ending their long journey from California. With the papers full of news of Gabrielle and her picture splashed across the front pages of the dozens of penny papers available throughout Paris, it instantly became clear to Gabrielle that she would have to come clean to Garanger, who was still seemingly one of the few people alive not to know the story of Gabrielle Bompard. Amazingly, Garanger took the news relatively well, all things considered. Naturally, Gabrielle's story was very different to Hero's. She had not been the murderer at all. It had all been Hero, she insisted. Garandra believed her enough and suggested that she hand herself into the police and explain her side of the story in order that the matter should be cleared up. And so it was that Gabrielle strolled into a local police station on the 21st of January 1890 and attempted to hand herself over to the officials. She only attempted because the official on duty, not recognising France's most wanted murderer, turned her away, stating that she would need a letter of introduction to speak to his superior on duty. Bewildered, Gabrielle slowly turned back and walked out of the station, deciding to try again the following day. The second day was a much greater success. The officer on duty recognised her immediately and contacted the prefect straight away. Unfortunately for Goran, he had been taken ill with a bad case of the flu following his trip to London, and so the chief inspector, Pierre Jean, was given the honours of placing her under arrest and escorting her back to prison. Until now, many people had been taken by Gabrielle's beauty, with the press often commenting on her good looks, but Jean later commented that when he saw her, he saw nothing but a monster. What struck him the most was her levity. As they clattered through the streets of Paris, heading for the investigating magistrate's office, she stared out of the window, thrilled to see the Paris sights once more, seemingly completely unaware of the gravity of the situation that she was now facing. Even after five hours of questioning that evening at the hands of the investigating judge Dopfer, failed to even dent her cheery demeanour. Throughout the questioning, Gabrielle remained calm and collected as she told them about the murder from start to finish. On the night of the murder, she had been out in Paris and she had returned home to find Aero in her apartment with an unknown man with red hair and moustache. Ero told her with some excitement that all of their financial troubles would soon be over, and then he disappeared, carrying a set of keys. When he returned to her apartment later that night, he was more animated, telling them they would have to flee. Collecting the large trunk from her room, they took the express train to Lyon and loaded the trunk into a horse and cart. In the hotel, the trunk had leaked a red substance that Gabrielle said she suspected may have been blood, but when she questioned Ayro on the trunk's contents, he continued to tell her nothing. The next day, they met with the red-haired man again on a road outside Lyon. Ayro and the mystery man took the trunk away, and an hour and a half later, Ayro returned to Gabrielle empty-handed. It was a peculiar story that none of the officials bought for a moment. Deciding to let Gabrielle rest and try again the following day, they called an end to the first day of questioning and sent Gabrielle off to stew alone in her small cell. First, though, she was taken to be measured and catalogued for the French criminal records as well as having her mugshot taken. When she learnt that she was to be photographed, she asked the police to allow her to head back to her hotel room and collect her hat in order that she look her best. Bemused, the officers denied her request, a move that for the first time seemed to rock Gabrielle, who burst into tears. 
The next day, to the surprise of absolutely no one, Gabrielle changed her story dramatically. Gone was the red-haired man, who she now admitted had been entirely fiction. Instead, she said that Ero had planned to extort Gouffet in order to help out his own money troubles, using Gabrielle as a kind of honey trap. However, as the planned evening drew closer, she realised that Ero had planned to kill him all along. On the night of the murder, Gouffet knocked on the door of Gabrielle's apartment, the address of which she had given him early that day. When she opened the door, she had been wearing nothing but a sheer dressing gown, the sash of which Ero had taught her to tie into a makeshift noose earlier that evening as he had installed a pulley onto one of the crossbeams in the ceiling. Gabrielle seduced Gouffet, sitting him down on the chaise long, straddled him and untied the sash of her dressing gown, passing it around his neck. At least, that was supposed to be the plan, but as she had gone to put the sash over Gouffet's head, something had made her stall. In a moment of clarity, she froze, prompting Aero to burst out of his hiding place behind the curtain, grab the sash and throw it over Gouffet's head himself. As he hauled the man into the air, the pulley gave way, tearing from the crossbeam, and Aero pounced on Gouffet as he struggled for air on the floor, putting his hands around his neck and throttling him. This entire story was told to the police with a peculiar detachment. Gabrielle was reporting the murder without a hint of emotion and seemed to the investigators as if she was acting like a witness rather than a participant. Chief Inspector Jorme found her calculating, though that was not the opinion of the press, who began to speculate that Gabrielle had been a hysteric. Reports were surfacing that A. Rowe had been an amateur hypnotist, and soon it became accepted that he had kept Gabrielle under her control. After all, it was already accepted that hysterics were naturally hypersensitive to such mechanisms. It was a huge twist to the case that drew academics, lawyers, doctors and psychologists out of the woodwork across the country. If Gabrielle was really hypnotised to carry out the crime, could she really be judged responsible for her actions? It was new ground in the courts and it posed huge moral questions for the justice system. Hypnotism was already a hotly debated subject and had been fashionable for several decades. And now it found itself rocketed into the spotlight. Hypnosis can trace its roots all the way back to ancient times, with shamans, healers and priests using methods remarkably similar to modern hypnosis, sometimes in combination with various herbs and spices. 2,000 years before the accepted beginnings of hypnotism in the West, Egyptians were using trance sleep-like meditations to induce somnambulistic states and hallucinations. Yogis, fakirs and Native Americans have all held rituals with healing elements that all seem in step with what we would now call hypnosis. It was Franz Anton Mesmer's work in the 18th and 19th centuries, however, that bore hypnotism to the Western mainstream. Physician to royalty and friends with Mozart, Mesmer believed that all things in nature shared a common magnetic force which could be manipulated to control the body and heal disease. As much a showman as he was a physician, he performed by waving his hands over a patient's body in particular mesmeric fashion much to the applause or derision of his colleagues. Despite widespread criticism, he nevertheless gained a rich and powerful following throughout Paris. In reality, Mesmer was actually utilising non-verbal hypnotic induction techniques in order to lull his patients into a sleep-like state. Not everyone was susceptible, but those that entered into a hysteric state beforehand were thought to be particularly able to fall into such sleeps. By the 1780s, Mesmer had set up a society for practitioners to train in his techniques and within a decade, serious scientific debate was being had in the French courts about both the efficacy of mesmerism and the legitimacy of the magnetic fluid theory. Contrary to Mesmer, the prevailing scientific opinion was that the trance states were little more than the products of a patient's imagination, or Mesmer's suggestion, rather than any magnetic fluid. Nevertheless, experiments continued and by the mid-19th century, a serious body of work using mesmerism as a form of anaesthetic for patients undergoing operations was well established, including an operation to remove a cancerous breast tumour in 1829 undertaken by a French surgeon named Jules Cloquet using mesmerism as the only form of anaesthesia. By the late 19th century, it was massively fashionable in both academic and entertainment circles. In 1889, when the Gouffet case broke into the news, 
The academic side of mesmerism was split by two leading French schools of thought. One, led by Dr. Ambroise Auguste Le Ball and Dr. Marie Bernheim, based in Nancy, and the other by French neurologist Jean-Martin Charcot, based in Paris. Bernheim and Lebo's Nancy School emphasised the psychological and therapeutic aspects of hypnosis, viewing it as a non-pathological state that could benefit individuals through suggestion and collaboration. In contrast, Charcot focused on the physiological and neuropathological aspects of hypnosis, considering it a condition associated with underlying neurological disorders and studying it from a more authoritarian perspective. In relation to the theory that Gabriel Bompard had attempted to kill Gouffet entirely due to hypnotic suggestion, the academics were ferociously split. The Parisian school believed that some individuals were more susceptible to hypnosis than others and that it would be impossible to have a hypnotised subject carry out any form of crime, whilst the Nancy school believed that everyone could be hypnotised and anything could be undertaken through the power of suggestion. This was a terrifying thought for many, with the very idea of morals being flexed without consent or knowledge, suggesting that anyone, even the most upstanding citizen, could become a hardened murderer under the control of an evil puppet master, which was more or less the argument that Gabrielle made to the police as her defence in the murder of Gouffet. This whole debate infuriated Chief Inspector Jean, who thought the suggestion that Gabrielle was anything more than a cold-hearted killer was ridiculous. Still, when the investigating judge took her on a trip to Lyon in order to have her give him a tour of the crime scenes there, he was amazed at the way that she remained detached throughout the entire journey, leading the Lyon police commissioner to state that he thought there is an unconsciousness so profound, an unawareness of remorse so absolute, that one is left stupefied. Meanwhile, whilst Gabrielle was busy making headlines in France, the American police were hot on the heels of Aero, or... At least that's how they wished the press would write about the investigation. In truth, they had tracked down Aero's movements whilst he had stayed in New York, questioning a landlady of a boarding house that he had stayed in and scammed out of $70, then onto the Greenwich Village room that he had rented before being tossed out for failing to pay rent, and then they followed his movements around the various brothels throughout the city. But after that, it seemed they had lost him. Rumours abound that he had fled to Mexico or was busy passing himself off as a silk merchant in Montreal, but wherever they followed, no trace could be found. Realising that in all likelihood they would need to bring Gabrielle to trial alone, the French authorities began gearing the case up for trial, submitting Gabrielle to a thorough medical examination in order to assess if she was fit to stand. The three doctors evaluated her mental condition for several months eventually concluding that she was hysteric and easily hypnotised. However, they doubted that hypnotism was responsible for the murder. The truth was, they said, that she simply lacked a moral compass and was perfectly fit to stand trial. By March, Goron was finally back in action after his prolonged sickness. His absence from the case had only driven his motivation to see it finished and he launched into action immediately, making it a priority to track down a row. He dispatched detectives to Mexico and New York, but nothing came of either venture, except further ridicule of the police. Then, finally, on the 21st of May, just after most of the papers had concluded that Aero had disappeared for good, the French police were alerted that he had been sighted in Havana, Cuba. Whilst the French detectives had been working with the American police traipsing around New York, Aero had been passing himself as a silk and textile merchant in Cuba under the name of Michel Gosky and attempting to scam people into investing in a fictional tobacco plantation. Two of his would-be victims, Michel and Marie Pouchet, had found him suspicious enough to shop him to the police, who had, somewhat amazingly, managed to find an old work colleague of Aero's in Havana who they used to gain a positive identification. Deciding to forgo the formalities of waiting for a warrant, the Havana officials had sprung an arrest on Aero whilst he was hanging around outside a brothel in the middle of the night. Finally, the puppet master was on his way back to France, and the truth could be discovered. With Aero's return to France, Judge Dopfer was brought back in to piece together his version of events. Much more amenable than Gabrielle at first, he quickly broke down and told the police everything. According to him, of course. Unsurprisingly, it was almost the direct opposite story to that of Gabrielle. As far as he was concerned, the plan to murder Gouffet had been all her idea and he had simply gone along with it 
unable to deny her anything, so enraptured with her that he was, in his own words, she drove him like a lapdog. He had also been reading the papers and found the hypnotist angle completely ridiculous, as he said he had only ever tried to hypnotise her once, and that was in the London bar for fun, an attempt that witnesses had said had already failed. Critically, for the murder, he assured police that it was Gabrielle who put the noose around Gouffet's neck and not him. In a fairly radical move, Doppler arranged for the two parties to come together back in Gabrielle's apartment, made up to perfectly reenact the scene of the crime, in the strange hopes that the rush of emotions might trigger one or the other party to come clean. The event garnered a huge amount of press and public attention, but ultimately was a complete disaster, as both sides just yelled at one another, blaming the other for the murder, though Aero did give a full account of the murder according to him. I did not strangle Gouffet. I hanged him, or better, we hanged him, Gabrielle and I. She took off the cordier that closed her dressing gown and she passed it over his neck, with it arranged in a slip knot. Then she put the cordier in the snap hook that I prepared. I pulled the rope, it rode through the pulley, and Gouffet found himself hanged. When the judge reminded Aero of the finger marks found on, on Gouffet's larynx and that there were ragged splinters of wood in the crossbeam above him, showing the pulley to have been pulled to the floor, Gabrielle yelled out that he had been lying and repeated her side of the story. If nothing else, Aero knew that he was finished and more than likely he was headed for the guillotine and so he was determined to take down Gabrielle with him. Despite their excitement for the spectacle beforehand, the press wasted no time in calling the whole thing utterly pointless afterwards. Wrapping up the investigation, Judge Dopfler set the date of the trial to begin on the 27th of October 1890. But after a newspaper released the opinions of the guilt of Aero and Gabrielle from two-thirds of the jury before the trial had even started, it had to be delayed whilst a new jury could be selected. Eventually, the trial opened on December the 16th and was scheduled to last for four days. The morning of December the 16th was cold and grey as the depths of winter swept in. Though it was never going to stop the huge crowds gathered outside the courthouse clamouring to buy tickets from the scalpers, selling prime seats for hugely inflated prices. At 11.45am, Michel Hérault and Gabrielle Bompard, both wearing black, were brought into the courtroom to sit before the three judges and had the charges of voluntary homicide with premeditation read to them. Following these pleasantries, Ero had the evidence read out against him first, with Gabrielle being removed from the courtroom for the duration. This evidence focused heavily on Ero's past in the military, of how he had run away, even going as far to suggest that he had been guilty of treason. Ero accused the court of slander, claiming that they were making false claims in order to stain his character, but the judge continued on all the same. In his reply, Ero first explained that the whole plan had been Gabrielle's idea, hoping that they could use the proceeds to clear his debts and then flee to Argentina together. At first, she had planned to rob a jeweller, he said, but later they had changed their target. For his part, he said he had never been keen on the idea, but eventually he relented to gain some cash via a criminal avenue. He then went on to explain that they only meant to kidnap Gouffet and extort his family for money. The hanging was only meant to show him that they meant business and hadn't meant to actually kill him. The process had gone so smoothly that he had died before they even knew it, and Aero said that he actually tried to resuscitate Gouffet whilst he lay on the floor of the apartment. Crucially, he made it very clear that Gabrielle had been the one to, to place the noose around Gouffet's neck. Gabrielle was then brought back into the room and the judge turned his question on to her, leading to a long string of denials where Gabrielle said she had known nothing of any plan to rob or murder anyone, that she had made the burlap sack the body was stored in without knowing its purpose and that she had played no part in the crime at all and could not recollect any more details. Even the sash, supposedly taken from her dressing gown, she suggested Aero had bought with him, which was enough of a claim that the prosecutor suggested she was giving absurd answers. Gabrielle merely replied with a laugh that there were many absurdities in this case, causing the audience to erupt in laughter and the court to be suspended. The second day of the trial saw Garandra become the star of the show, as he was interrogated by the judges and told the courtroom that he had hypnotised Gabrielle several times for fun even though he was not very skilled in the process, and that she had always been a very susceptible subject. During this interrogation, 
Gabrielle erupted into what the papers called a fit of hysterics, where she rolled around on the bench until she was carried out of the room and brought back in later once she had calmed down. The case became truly interesting from the third day when the experts were called in to give their own evidence on the case. By now, the trial was beginning to show its strain on the participants, and both Aero and Gabrielle were described as looking worried, with Gabrielle paler than usual following her previous day's bout of hysteria. Dr. Lassasagna, who had carried out the autopsy upon Gouffet's body, was called to give his medical evidence, where he told the court that he felt there were hand marks on the victim's throat and that he thought he had been strangled rather than hanged. Though he conceded that he was not certain due to the poor state of the body through decomposition. A second doctor said that he also believed that death had been caused by strangulation, but just to muddy these waters further, a third doctor believed that Gouffet was hanged by the dressing gown sash. Then came the medical doctors who had explained to the court their opinions on Gabrielle's hypnotism defence. Gabrielle showed not the slightest trace of mental alienation. From a moral point of view, she was a vicious girl, given to lying, but at the same time she was intelligent. She was constitutionally hysterical and subject to crisis de nerf, such as came upon her on the previous day. She is hypnotisable, but only to a very small extent. We got her to sleep easily after telling her that we did not intend to ask her any questions about the crime, but only as to facts in her childhood. Whilst in this sleeping condition, she answered the questions put to her. This fresh examination did not lead us to alter our opinion in any way. She is, as I have said, extremely intelligent and knows well the consequences of the acts she does. We have remarked, however, that she is absolutely lacking in a sense of moral responsibility, and this failing may be compared to a malady such as blindness or deafness. Gabrielle's defence attorney, Henri Robert, confirmed that she had been put to sleep frequently and then asked if such experiments might have affected her mental state negatively. Next came Dr. Sir Crest, the Bompard family medical doctor who had been tasked by Gabrielle's father to hypnotise Gabrielle in an attempt to alter her behaviour before she had run away to Paris. The doctor confirmed that he had hypnotised Gabrielle on several occasions and that on each she had always been a good hypnotic subject, despite his efforts ultimately fading in the eyes of her father. Though he fell short of stating his belief that hypnotism could be held responsible entirely for the murder of Gouffet, he did say that over time, and with repeated sessions of hypnotic suggestion, he believed that Gabrielle could have been influenced to commit a crime against her free will. In conclusion, Robert asked the doctor to confirm that he had always found Gabrielle to be kind and sensitive, which he agreed to, stating that he had been much astonished to learn that she had committed such a crime. If Dr. Sacrest's testimony had made waves in the court, it was only a warm-up for the hypnosis experts to come. Dr. Lea Joie, described in the press as the champion of the medical school at Nancy, saved his testimony until the next day, which was fortunate as the hypnosis expert spent the first two hours of his long speech giving the courtroom a drawn-out overview of hypnotism as an academic subject. Crucially, he confirmed that he believed that in hypnotism there is a complete absence of will in the subject and that any suggestion made by the hypnotizer passes into the subject and inspires him or her into action. With this he cited his own experiments on the matter where he had a woman fire a pistol at a friend or a second test where he had a man attempt to poison his own cousin with sugar that he had been told under hypnosis was arsenic. He then went on to say that it could have been perfectly possible for Ero to have exercised his influence over Gabrielle, then under hypnotic suggestion, having her forget that he had done so, concluding after four long hours of testimony, I do not mean to say that whoever commits a crime is not responsible, but there are persons who perpetrate crimes under the influence of hypnotism, and I hope that the jury, bearing this possibility in mind, will say to themselves, it is better to cut off one's hand than to sign an unjust sentence. Given the length of Liergeois' speech, the court was adjourned at the end of the day and an extra fifth day was added to the trial with the verdict expected at the end of the day. The morning opened with the prosecution pleading with the jury to forget their love of the fantastic. If hypnotism explains the crime, it is a way to deny free will. Then we must recognise there is no such thing as human freedom. There will be no conscious choice between good and evil. No criminal will be accountable for the blood that he spills and the book of eternal justice will be closed. It was all dramatic stuff. A Rose lawyer countered in his closing statement 
that it was simply a crime of passion, with Ero controlled by his passion for his lover, Gabrielle Bompard, claiming that his client had been seduced by her so completely that he obeyed her totally and was finally lured into evil by her charm. In response, Gabrielle's lawyer closed by stating that Gabrielle had suffered a poor upbringing at the hands of an unloving father and had gone on to be consumed by an abusive relationship with Ero, who had hypnotised her and given her instructions to kill Gouffet. If anything, he said, she should have been applauded for having the moral strength to have pulled herself out of her trance at the last minute, refusing to put the makeshift noose over Gouffet's head. At 6.45pm, the jury stepped out to deliberate their conclusions, returning a verdict two hours later, finding Aero guilty with no recommendation of mercy, whilst Gabrielle was found guilty but with extenuating circumstances. Aero was sentenced to death whilst Gabrielle was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment with hard labour. The courtroom erupted into a scene that was said to reflect a miniature imitation of Bedlam, with the crowd jeering at both Aero and Gabrielle. As Aero was taken from the courtroom, he fell into a faint and was handed a glass of black coffee with brandy to stabilise his nerves. Gabrielle, on the other hand, was said to have been overjoyed by her sentence. She stepped into her cell that night and ate a dinner of soup, boiled beef and drank half a bottle of wine. Over the following year, Aero attempted to appeal his sentence twice, both times being rejected. Eventually, on the 3rd of February 1891, he was marched out into the prison yard at 7.20am and placed onto the board. The executioner pressed a single button to let the blade of the guillotine fall, sending his head into a basket on the ground. Gabrielle served 12 years of her sentence, mainly working as a bookkeeper for the prison's corset-making enterprise. She was released on the 8th of June, 1903, and though she sought to make a career in the spotlight, re-enacting the murder under hypnosis, by the time she was free, the craze for hypnotism as entertainment had long since passed. And despite the concept of hypnotic suggestion gaining academic acceptance in years following the trial, it was all perhaps rather fortunate, as she was denied entry to the USA anyway. Following her disappointing career on the stage and realising her 15 minutes of fame were truly over, she faded out into obscurity, making a living with embroidery. Gabrielle died aged 52 on the 9th of December 1920. The case of Michel Ayreau and Gabrielle Bompard was remarkable for being the first case to use hypnosis as a defence and for the huge implications that would have followed had the defence been successful and a precedence been set. The case was one of the key components to a law passing in 1892 that outlawed amateur hypnosis in France. And though in the years following there was a lull in the public enthusiasm for hypnosis, from the mid-20th century onwards, experimentation into the subject from an academic and medical perspective has continued. Questions concerning the level of influence one holds over a hypnotic subject, along with themes of suggestion, were experimented with from a modern psychological perspective, with the limits of human self-control still being debated and disputed right up until today, though legally speaking, it has never been used as a successful defence. So that was the story of Michel Ero and Gabrielle Bompard and the murder of Gouffet. And we shall talk a little bit about that after this short advert breaks. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you ever find that just as you're trying to fall asleep, your brain suddenly won't stop talking? Do your thoughts start racing right before bed or at other inopportune moments? I can absolutely agree with a resounding yes that that happens to me all the time. It turns out, one great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. Therapy gives you a place to do that, so you can get out of your negative thought cycles and find some mental and emotional peace. This happens to me all the time, and to be honest, it's the main reason I started Dark Histories, or one of the main reasons I started Dark Histories. Dark Histories was just a way to pull myself out of my own head, and in the same vein... Talking to others and th doing therapy uh, is it, it's, it's essentially the same thing. You're pulling yourself out of your own head. You're, you're talking, giving yourself a bit of room to voice the sort of issues that you're having. 
And BetterHelp is, is great for this because it's entirely online. It's really convenient. I mean, that's it's literally what it's designed for. You know, it's flexible uh, and to suit, made to suit your schedule. Uh, you just fill out a brief questionnaire. You get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, why not give BetterHelp a shot? So visit betterhelp.com slash dark histories today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash dark histories. That's all one word, D-A-R-K-H-I-S-T-O-R-I-E-S. Cheers. Welcome back. So yeah, that was a story, wasn't it? I thought it was a, like I say, I, I really wanted to do the story because it basically it was set in Paris again. And I thought it would be just a, a kind of fun juxtaposition to put it just after another episode that was done in Paris, but so many years before. One thing that did stick out to me was I said yes, uh, was I said last episode that, you know, it was, it was incredible how modern the investigation was. And then you take a case like this into concern with the investigation was huge and you realise that it was actually... Although it was, you know, I still, I don't take it back. It was, it was quite modern for, for a medieval investigation. It paled in comparison to this one, right? Like the, the sheer scale of this investigation. Of course, this was a large investigation, you know, it, uh, it ended up being a sort of global manhunt. You know, it, it was, it, this was by, just by scale, it just showed how much more modern it was. And, and obviously this is, you know, still 150 years ago itself. Anyway. I thought it was really interesting. I I I, th- I thought the hypnosis um, line. I, I, to, to be honest, I'm surprised it, it didn't happen sooner than this. You know, 1889. I thought it's actually quite late for someone to try their luck with with this sort of defence. Uh, you know, you'd expect it to be much sooner. So I was quite surprised it was actually so late for the for the first uh, attempt. Um, do I believe it? I, 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 do you know? Funnily enough, I I don't believe it's hypnosis, but I, I feel like. Probably both parties told some amount of truth. I think, um, certainly, I think Ero probably did end up strangling her. Um, I think two or th- out of three doctors suggested that it that it he had um, finger marks around his neck. And and I, although the, the the corpse was really decomposed, the very first doctor to ever see it said straight away that in in his autopsy report that he he felt that it was hand marks around the neck, not. Uh, a sash so I, I sort of do think that 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 probably is what happened and also the, the fact that the pulley had ripped out of the ceiling I, I'm fairly sure that's what happened so they, they tried to hang him and uh, the, the pulley had ripped out the ceiling from the weight of Gouffet's body who was quite a large guy by the way um, you know it would have ripped the pulley out of the ceiling and then uh, Ero would have jumped on him and strangled him with his hand so I think that side of Gabrielle's story was was definitely true but then I, I also think that A Rose was probably telling the truth about the hypnosis and that it, it just wasn't true. I don't like he said that he only tried to hypnotize her once um, and that it was a failure. Um, and there, there was evidence to prove that he had, that, that at that time he had he had failed. There was witnesses that had seen it. But I, I don't know whether he tried to hypnotize her more than once or, or not. But I do believe that he was telling the truth that he didn't hypnotize her to kill Gouffet. I think all the rest of his whatever he said was a lie. I think he was a bit of a jealous man that was tr- basically, he wanted Gabrielle to uh, have her head lopped off on the guillotine once he realised that he was done for. So I think the rest of it was all just lies. Uh, the whole thing where, you know, he was smitten by Gabrielle and, you know, he just went along with whatever she said. I think that was complete fabrication. I think he made up, when you look at his past history, he had a criminal history of conning people, making up lies, uh, violence, the guy basically had it all in him. So I, I think it was, I, I, so I do think that he was lying about that case. So I do think that um, it was all his, I, I do think it was his plan. I think he talked Gabrielle into going along with it. Either, uh, and this is where I think uh, Gabrielle is somewhat telling the truth, but not, but, but, but not with the hypnosis. I think that she probably did go along with the murder because she was compelled to. And I do think, she was influenced. You know, these words compelled and influenced. I think they definitely had a part in her doing it, but I don't think it was through hypnosis. I think she was simply an abused woman. I think she was in an, an abusive relationship and I think she was terrified and I think she went along with it. And that's not to sort of say that she didn't wasn't up for it. She went along with the killing and all the rest of it. She says that she didn't put the, the sash around his neck. I don't... 
really believe that. It doesn't seem like that's the case when you look into um, what got on. I think she actually did place the sash a- around his neck. So that whole part of uh, um, freezing and, 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 and finally finding some moral compass in this hypnotic haze is, is all nonsense. That, that was all to support the hypnosis defence. I'm not saying she wasn't uh, involved in the, the, in the murder, but I do think that um, you know, she was heavily influenced uh, by this uh, abusive relationship. Um, so that's, that's my opinion on it. I think the hypnosis side of things is really interesting. And it's the fascinating part of the case, of course. But I don't think it's true. I, I don't think it's the case. I think a lot of um, the the accounts of the hypnosis get bogged down in this idea that she was also a hysteric, which, which we you know those sorts of medical diagnoses these days are, are, are largely ridiculed. You know that you know this these, these outdated medical ideas that women were susceptible to hysteria um, uh, and, and and sort of a petty petty hysteric and grand hysteric. Uh, they're, they're all just out the window now. So I, I don't think any of that stuff, that side of it, that hysteria and the um, hypnosis side of it really comes into it. Uh, I, I think, say, that was just a clever defence at the time, really. So I think more likely was that she was cold calculating. Like like the chief inspector said, she was cold, she was calculating, she knew exactly what she was doing. Uh, she, uh, I think that's much more likely. I think uh, she was cold calculating just the same way as Arrow was. I think uh, they were both violent killers. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's my opinion on it. All the same, I say, I, I do think it was really interesting. And the hypnosis angle was really fascinating. So, yeah, that's about that. I hope you enjoyed the story. Uh, I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Until then, if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can do so. Uh, contact at darkhistories.com is the email address. You can also find that in the show notes, which is where you'll find links to everything, including, uh, you know, all the ways that you can get in touch with me via social media on the website, darkhistories.com, all the ways that you can support the show, links to the Patreon if you'd like to get involved with that side of things. Uh, But otherwise, thanks very much for listening. I hope you had a great time. Uh, Thank you for lending me your ears once more. And I will see you very soon uh, in a couple of weeks with another episode where we shall move away from France and into something entirely different. So until then, thanks very much for listening. Take care. Sleep tight.